Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for our Miami Pediatric Neurosurgery Symposium. Uh, tonight, we have um, our topic uh, is relating around hydrocephalus research advances and future clinical directions. So I thank uh, Dr. Strali and Dr. Kale for um, speaking this evening, and I'll pass it on to Dr. McRae. Uh, so obviously many of our symposia have been focused strictly around uh, clinical topics and how we manage things as pediatric neurosurgeons, uh, but we thought it was important to also have some more research focused topics. Uh, so we're thrilled uh, today to have both of our uh, presenters who are both pediatric neurosurgeons and scientists focused on the topic of hydrocephalus. Uh, so uh, they're going to share with us some of their research and then uh, we'll transition into a discussion of how that will likely impact our care uh, in the future. Uh, so first up, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Jennifer Strally uh, from Wash U. Uh, she's the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery um, at Wash U. Uh, and next up, uh, we will have uh, Christopher Colley, uh, who was at Yale University and has recently uh, transitioned uh, to being uh, the Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at MGH. Uh, within the Harvard system. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. Thank you both of you for speaking tonight. And then Dr. McRae, talk till 4.30 or how long? Yeah, basically 25, 30 minutes, something like that. Then we'll do uh, the other talk and then discuss. Sounds good. Um, thanks, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this symposium, which I found to be super helpful. And um, over the last, what is it, year and a half now, almost I think a couple of years since you guys started it. So I'm going to touch upon some clinical aspects of hydrocephalus and weave in some research. Um, and what I'd like to do is try to get some of you thinking about, and I think a lot of us think about hydrocephalus in a lot of different ways, but some of the insights that I've learned over the last several years researching hydrocephalus um, and start thinking about it in maybe a slightly expanded way from how we traditionally have thought about hydrocephalus. Um, so, so here are a few examples of kids with hydrocephalus, different size ventricles, different brain morphologies. Um, you have genetic uh, hydrocephalus on the left. And I'd also like to note that aqueductal stenosis, um, and I know is our audience mostly pediatric neurosurgeons, Dr. McCray and, and Dr. Niazi? It's kind or, of a uh, mixture of pediatric neurosurgeons okay. and um, others, pediatricians, med students. So. Great. Okay. We, we usually have a num number of attending pediatric neurosurgery, some trainees and some affiliated specialties like neurology, ophthalmology, things like that. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, I wanted to point out that aqueductal stenosis, when I think we traditionally think about it as a web in the aqueduct is actually, we can see aqueductal stenosis as a final common pathway from a, a lot of different things. And when the ependema or the sort of brain develops in a slightly different way, like in the upper left, the aqueduct is stenosed, but it's more from an overall um, elongated brainstem. So just even thinking about things like aqueduct, aqueductal stenosis in a lot of different ways. So hydrocephalus is sort of a final common pathway of a lot of different causes. You have NF1 on the upper right, and this was a kid that presented with sort of Chiari symptoms, as well as some symptoms from hydrocephalus and ended up doing an ETV and a Chiari decompression. Um, she has a diagnosis of NF1. And on the, the two pictures on the right, you can see some transependymal flow and that's become, I'm not sharing it, uh, anything about that today, but um, we've done some more interesting sort of focused in on understanding which regions of the ependem are, are able to transmit CSF across the ependymal lining. Um, and so there's a couple different examples there. Um, obviously kids with myelomeningocele and then this child with the preterm IVH here, I don't know if you guys can see my, my pointer here. Um, this child had a pre, uh, it should actually be prenatal IVH. So before, before they were actually born. Um, so you can have big ventricles and hydros and clin and associated clinical hydrocephalus, um, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, here's another example of different patterns of transependymal flow, which is, um, I'll get to a little bit later as well. So here are just a few videos that I'm going to play sort of all at once and you can, and sort of peek, peek around. These are all from Chiari cases. And I wanted to introduce the idea that this is a very dynamic system. So not only do we see, we see these static images of big ventricles, but there's a lot going on. So these are all images from Chiari surgeries where 
there's expectedly more motion of the tonsils or the brain stem. Um, but just playing this video on the on on the left again, um, you can even see just the the small arachnoid membrane underneath the dura uh, moving. And this is a very dynamic process that involves a lot of structures, not only the ventricles, but a lot of structures in and around the CNS. Um, here are a few more videos of these structures. So we have the arachnoid. This is an, on the upper left is arachnoid coming in through a peel away sheath in the setting of a cyst fenestration. In the upper right is choroid plexus uh, as part of a choroid plexus cauterization. I would like to point out that the choroid plexus there already looks a little bit atretic. This was in a case about five years ago when I think there was a short window of enthusiasm for uh, ETV CPC for post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, um, which I know is sort of waned a little bit, but or uh, decreased, excuse me, a little bit over time, the enthusiasm. And then in the lower, the lower left hand corner is uh, a spinal tumor. I just wanted to highlight the dura and the arachnoid and how the CSF is, you know, flows both within underneath the arachnoid, but also above the arachnoid between the arachnoid and the dura. And then finally, here is the uh, arachnoid in the basal cisterns. And just try, just wanting you to think a little bit about not only the CSF and the ventricles, but that how it might communicate and flow between and within these structures. So um, here's sort of an outline of, that I made just for this talk as I was sort of putting it together and wanting to sort of segment it into different different areas and figure out you know where where do we need to go with our with our research um, as we're most of us are pediatric focused or pediatric neurosurgeons um, there's a few different uh, groups of pediatric hydrocephalus and while there is childhood hydrocephalus from the conditions I list on the left tumors and aqueductal stenosis, AVMs, trauma, the majority of hydrocephalus is diagnosed when kids are young. So whether it's congenital, prenatally diagnosed or immediately diagnosed or, or um, in, the, in the newborn period or perinatally. And, and I think this is interesting because it corresponds with a critical period of neurodevelopment, whether it's preterm or even in the first couple of years of life. Um, the most common causes that we see as pediatric neurosurgeons are intraventricular hemorrhage associated hydrocephalus from preterm germinal matrix hemorrhage, as well as myelomeningocele. So here's, here are sections from, this is a paper from Mark Del Biggio back in 2011. And this is an example of the germinal matrix involuting over time. So the germinal matrix is displayed in the bottom panel by KI67 staining. And you have the germinal matrix is a site of new neuron development. And you see the germinal matrix is adjacent to the ventricle. So it's contributing a lot of new neurons um, that flow along CSF pathways um, to their destination. And this involutes over time, but during this, this period, and now kids are born as early as 22 weeks, in that sort of 22 week to 30 week time period, it's at risk for bleeding. And not only does the bleeding occur in the germinal matrix, but then it extends into the ventricular system. And then as pediatric neurosurgeons, we focus a lot on the hydrocephalus, but I would argue we really need to be thinking about treatment. And I think a lot of people are, and I think the conversation has changed a lot in the last five and five and 10 years. Um, but along with that hydrocephalus is altered neurodevelopment. I mean, the hemorrhage is occurring within this germinal matrix and thinking about strategies to prevent not only hydrocephalus, but also altered brain injury, I think are important in thinking about research advances within the hydrocephalus space. Um, here are a few articles. This science article from 2008, I believe is super interesting. And I, I, it sort of sticks with me. Um, this is in the adult brain. Um, I think we all know about cilia and on the, on the right of this screen is, um, a new cilia knockout that a, a cilia gene knockout that not surprisingly develops hydrocephalus. I think probably not in part just to simply for 
simply because the cilia aren't moving, but but because there's potentially altered brain development from maybe perhaps the cilia not moving their moving growth factors to the right locations that they need to go. And then also actually new neurons. So going back to the left of the screen over here, this study looked at the flow of neurons and how cilia movement altered the flow of neurons, which I think is pretty neat having that interconnected um, sort of neuronal development, hydrocephalus inner uh, integrated potentially pathophysiology. Um, and then the, the example in the middle is another science article from 2016, which, which shows how complex the flow networks are within the third ventricle. So these are flow maps of CSF within the third ventricle, showing that there's a very specific and highly coordinated flow of CSF in that area. Um, and then finally, in the lower left, there's a, uh, one of my favorite titles, and Chris has probably heard this before because I know we've given several talks together. Um, this lakefront property article um, that was the title in a neuron paper a couple years old now um, from Alvarez Bullia, um, just highlighting that right underneath the ventricular surface is a, a, a robust niche of, of important uh, cells uh, contributing to brain development. So so my focus it has been primarily neonatal germinal matrix hemorrhage, interventricular hemorrhage. And for a brief review, it's common, about 14,000 cases each year. 25% of patients develop high-grade IVH. 40% with high-grade IVH have poor neurologic outcomes. And here's, here's an example of a patient over time where these are ultrasounds showing progressive increase in ventricular size. And ultimately they had concurrent clinical symptoms associated with the ventricular size. You can have large ventricles without necessarily having clinical hydrocephalus, but this, this patient did, and we, we have no treatments for prevention of this. And so that's, that's been one of my goals is to try to figure out a way to prevent, prevent this hydrocephalus from occurring to begin with. Here are, is an, and I'll just touch on the slide briefly, just an overview of potential treatments. What I'd like to highlight here is that most of these are temporizing or um, they're, they're, they're temporizing procedures and palliative and not really preventative. I think the DRIFT trial was a great attempt at trying to flush out some of the blood products and actually prevent hydrocephalus. And the long-term outcomes from that study were actually quite good in terms of their cognitive outcome. Um, it was stopped early due to hemorrhagic complications, but um, and then, and then the endoscopic evacuation of IVH is another one that, um, you know, I think is being tried more often, uh, but we still don't have a perfect answer for a lot of types of hydrocephalus. Um, there are a number of preclinical models, um, in an attempt, and I'd like to highlight the hands, the hands, uh, uh, which is the hydrocephalus association network for discovery science is having a focus on hydrocephalus animal, animal model seminar series over the next month. So if you check out the HANS website, um, there's a lot of interesting talks related to animal models of hydrocephalus. Um, it's been a challenge to mimic the clinical pathology specifically. I think we're doing a lot better in the last couple of years in doing that. Um, my goal has been to understand how blood products in the ventricle or in the brain results in hydrocephalus. And I'll just focus in on um, the animal model that we've use, used in the past and are using currently. Um, and I'm sharing some of this information. We have a few papers that are in the submission process that um, since this is recorded, I'm gonna not go into super detail uh, with those, but I'll, I'll share some of this, uh, especially the more clinical information um, to, get, to get everyone thinking about you know, more ways that we can in, in influence the, the natural history of hydrocephalus in, in infants. So there's a lot of different components of blood. It, it's a multifactorial process. However, if you inject whole blood into the ventricle in, in animals, it doesn't do much. You either have to inject an extremely large volume or uh, lyse the red blood cells or inject blood products. So um, add an attempt to figure out which blood products our results in hydrocephalus. Uh, we previously injected iron, uh, protoporphyrin 9, which is um, heme without the iron, hemoglobin, 
blood, lice red blood cells, and found that hemoglobin, a very small volume of hemoglobin resulted in ventricular enlargement. And we now show that it, it re produces chronic hydrocephalus in a very clinical way. So with clinical, similar rates of, of what we see clinically for neonatal IVH. Um, here's an example of, of MR, rat, rat MRIs for this. Um, interestingly, a couple of years later, so this was in 2020, we looked at a, a cohort of infants, this is humans now, and looked at their early lumbar puncture CSF for different blood components to figure out which iron pathway products in the CSF were predictive of later development of hydrocephalus. So we binned patient, we grouped patients into controls, um, low grade IVH, high grade IVH, which is our, the, the, the interventricular hemorrhage that, um, we see is most associated with hydrocephalus, um, as well as those with IVH that ultimately went on to develop hydrocephalus. And interestingly, out of all the blood products, hemoglobin, which is what we found in the animals, we found that hemoglobin levels in the CSF were significantly associated with hydrocephalus um, that sort of discriminated between the high grade IVH group and then the group that went on to develop hydrocephalus. So we saw sort of a clinical validation of what we saw preclinically. And hemoglobin, in addition to bilirubin and ferritin, all three of those levels, higher levels correlated with larger ventricle sizes as well. Here's uh, a little bit about some of the stuff we've been working on more recently, um, introducing uh, a potential treatment. So in this case, um, interventricular deferoxamine, which is an iron chelator. Deferoxamine has a couple of different functions, but um, injecting that into the ventricle and looking at its effect over time. And we found that a small dose, a clinically relevant small dose, single dose, it prevents hydrocephalus for um, a period of time in animals that would be similar to a period of time of a child in the NICU. Um, so there is some potential clinical treatments down the line that I'm not going to get into the rest of it now, but wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, here's a clinical example of a patient with IVH. And so hemorrhage, the hemorrhage in the ventricles is, affects the ependema. You can see the hemosiderin on the ependymal surface. Sometimes it look, will wash away if you, and again, I haven't done a ton of ETV or ETV CPC for this condition because it, it doesn't in the end work very well. But in the cases that we've done, sometimes the blood will, will stick around um, on the appendix. sometimes it washes away. And here's an example of a blood clot in the lower left that sort of embedded, this was a patient that was transferred to our institution at six months uh, for an ETV. And you see how this blood is sort of embedded into the ependymal wall and then there's scar formation over it. So there's a very interactive connection between the blood and the ependymal and the ventricular system. Um, I realize I have about seven minutes. Actually, I think we're, I wanted to get to some of our clinical stuff. So I'm just gonna skip over a few of those things and sort of come to this summary point slide. So I've showed you a little bit of a window into modeling post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and the clinical effects of post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Um, one of the biggest challenges to hydrocephalus research that I found is understanding, even in the normal condition, how CSF moves within and around the CNS. So there are different theories that I know a lot of us are familiar with. We may have some folks even that on, on the call that are leaders in the lymphatic and lymphatic space in terms of fluid handling. But we really don't know, especially in the developing brain, how CSF moves within and around the CNS. It is not no, we don't know how solutes are cleared from the brain. Um, I'll say again that pediatric hydrocephalus occurs during critical periods of neurodevelopment. And the interaction of the CSF with the brain and how CSF is cleared likely changes at different stages of, of development. For instance, there are no lymphatics that are present at birth and they evolve over, over time. So while they may be handling CSF in an adult, there might be other routes that the immune system interfaces with the CSF in young kids that we don't yet understand. So 
in an attempt to uh, sort of holistically look at this, um, we developed a high resolution uh, gold nanoparticle enhanced X-ray nanotomography. And it's a, it's a fancy CT scanner that looks at micrometer scale resolution. The gold is used as a contrast agent. And I wanted to just introduce briefly that we've been able to, one, replicate what others have shown, but also on a much higher resolution scale, track where this, this CSF is, is moving. Um, and we've also validated this now with, um, we have a new uh, small animal MRI scanner with a great coil. So we've been able to show this in vivo with gadolinium in, in uh, gadolinium uh, in the CSF as well. Um, and here is just an example on the left of the setup that we've used. And this is a, an ex, just an, a gross example of the brain showing that it is cleared over time. So this is not something that is sort of getting into these spaces and staying, but we do think that it is a reasonable tracer to be able to see. Um, and we have the ability to, to do these 2D and 3D scans um, and try to understand at a little bit of a higher resolution level in the developing brain, how CSF is actually moving. Um, and here are just some th very sort of uh, uh, straightforward 3D reconstructions of some of the larger pathways that we're seeing. Um, we see a lot of uh, fluid handling at the base of the brain, opposed to the sagittal sinus, where I think in a, you know, in adults and older animals, there's a lot of focus on the superior sagittal sinus. We see a lot more going on in the transverse sinus region, um, cerebellum. And then here in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the, the particles sort of outlining the MCA and some of the um, structures that we're familiar with in, in you know, the, the in vivo two photon my, microscopy that's been used for, for glymphatics. So um, I'm not gonna go into more detail there. Uh, and I hope to talk with all of you, you know, at a soon later date, um, a little bit more about this because we've uh, found some exciting things that I'm looking forward to sharing with everyone. Um, so in the last sort of five minutes, I wanted to tie, so I talked about hydrocephalus and I wanted to just tie back in some of the, the hydrocephalus ideas to neurodevelopment. Um, and I know I'm, I'm sort of perhaps proposing more questions than answers in this, in the, in this talk, but things that I think to think about are how, you know, how, where are these links between hydrocephalus and neurodevelopment? So here is a clinical cohort of patients from WashU that both full-term, preterm, uh, low-grade IVH, high-grade IVH, and then those kids that ultimately required treatment for PHH. And you see this circled PHH group here. When you look, we looked at their hippocampal volumes because it was something we saw in our animals that we saw that there was a decrease in hippocampal size. And it's not unexpected. The hippocampus lies directly subjacent to the ventricle. We, so a, a little surprisingly, um, compared to even other types of preterm brain injury like IVH and cystic PBL, um, we found that those kids with PHH had significantly smaller volumes than even other types of preterm brain injury. Um, and this was a collaboration between um, Regina Triplet, Triplet and Chris Miser and Dave Lembrick. Um, and we found this, this brain injury cohort, the, dot, the dash line, shows the correlation of Bailey's cognitive scores with the hippocampal volumes. And if you, if we uh, uh, take a look at our ventricle size, which is measured here as a front occipital horn ratio, we see that there is a correlation between hippocampal size. So um, larger ventricles are associated with smaller hippocampal size. So there is um, a relationship between this memory structure and hippocampal size. We recently, just this year, uh, extended some of, the, some of these findings to, the hydro, to a multi-center cohort from the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network. And all of these patients had PHH, just because it's, it's to get recruited into, in, into the study, you had to have hydrocephalus. And we looked again at some of the iron handling proteins that I spoke about earlier, at how they're cleared over time, um, so we looked at time of temporizing treatment. So a lot of the preterm infants that have, um, that end up developing hydrocephalus require a temporizing treatment, like a reservoir prior to a shunt placement. Um, we looked at them at both time points and then how they changed over time. 
And we found that hemopexin and ferritin were associated with ventricle size, hemopexin. So hemopexin is a heme scavenger. So higher hemopexin levels equal to lower ventricle size, whereas ferritin, higher ferritin levels were associated with larger ventricles. And then interestingly, um, we looked at transferrin levels initially because of its iron handling role, but it turns out the choroid plexus produces more transferrin by weight than the liver. And, and transferrin flows very similar to CSF. And we found that kids that had an increase in transferrin levels over time were more likely to have better outcomes. And you, it, there's a couple explanations for that. One could be they just had less choroid plexus injury. So it's a marker of less injury over time, or they had more recovery of their choroid plexus function. So um, it's an interesting finding that I think deserves further study. Um, and then finally, we found that if you have higher transferrin levels over time, uh, it's associated with, with worse cognitive motor and functional outcomes. Um, and I think that I will, I had one last section, but um, it's 4.30. So um, Chris, I know you're, have a lot of uh, much more interesting thing, much more interesting things to discuss. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. And I'll just remind the audience while we're getting started with our second talk, if you have questions, just type them on the chat function. And then when we finish the second talk, we'll go through uh, all the audience questions for both speakers. Thanks so much. And one quick thing, and this will take like three minutes while you guys are figuring out the other PowerPoint. Um, related to ventricle size, um, we I think there's a question. I, I always have a question of like, how big can the ventricles be? You know, I know that the goal in treating hydrocephalus is that we want to maintain head circumference or, you know, stop head growth and make sure the fontanelle is not full, but how big are, you know, how big can you tolerate ventricles? So recently we looked at ventricle size in preterm infants with PHH and looked at a cumulative ventricle size over time from birth until the time of permanent CSF diversion. So the time of like ETV or shunt placement, and we found that earlier time at permanent shunt placement, as well as smaller cumulative ventricle size over time was associated with better outcomes. So that's just another sort of food for thought about thinking about ventricle size and outcomes. And then I will thank my lab um, here who, um, I know I didn't show a lot of the sort of basic science stuff today, mm -hmm. Um, but we have a, a great lab and a lot of collaborator, collaborators, especially for the, the clinical work. So thank you to everyone, as well as our funding sources. Um, yeah. I have a question for you, Jen, um, before, uh, since we yeah. have some time here. So um, what is your guys' take right now on when to place a reservoir in these preemie IVH kids? There's no... You know, there's no consensus amongst the pediatric neurosurgeons as to what the exact timing is of um, actually placing these reservoirs. And it's something that our group has discussed extensively. I know the um, HCRN has discussed it as well, but I wanted to get your take on, you know, what do you guys do? And with the research that you've done, um, what do you think is the right timing and the management of these preemie IVH kids? Yeah. That's a great question. And I just thought a lot about this as I was putting together the discussion for that paper. We did not, at least in the cohort that we looked at from here that had, you know, two-year outcomes with Bailey's testing, we did not find that the time at reservoir placement or cumulative ventricle size prior to reservoir placement was associated with outcome. We found that it was that, that time at permanent shunt placement. So I think that reservoirs are great in that they, you know, can be a temporizing measure, but they're not continuously removing blood products. So looking at the, there were four papers from the Elvis trial out of Europe, the early versus late intervention. Um, I, if you look at their, their sort of overall conclusions, I think the, the folks that ran the trial would say that earlier intervention was helpful. I think if you dig into the data, um, it's a little less clear. Early intervention included LPs in addition to reservoirs, and they weren't always like segmented out between who got what. Mm -hmm. And I felt like my, and these, these are my interpretations. And I think that there's, you know, we can have a larger discussion about it. Um, 
it seemed to me like a lot of kids that we may not think about intervening on that may never need a reservoir got got reservoir because because the re- the requirements were so strict. Um, so I don't have a perfect answer. I think that we should think about temper like timing of temporary treatment, but based on what we found, I also think we should think about like when to definitively manage the hydrocephalus. Cause even if you put a reservoir in, you're only taking out like right. a small amount of CSF. Even if you do daily taps, it's not um, continuous drainage. Um, so in short, Dr. Niazi, I don't have a great answer. I think that the data from the Elvis trial is mixed and maybe we should be thinking a little bit about timing of permanent intervention. Perfect. All right. I think Dr. Kale, I think you're ready to go then. All right. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be uh, talking very briefly um, about the translational genomics of congenital neurosurgical diseases, but focusing on uh, congenital hydrocephalus for obvious reasons. So I feel like Jen and I are always giving talks at the same at the same venues. We're kind of at the same stage of our career. So it's been a it's been great to have a kind of a comrade through all this stuff. And I'm super excited to see the the studies in preparation, especially with the the um, in regard to fluid drainage patterns, which are a complete you know mystery to me. So the more I dig into hydrocephalus, whether it's congenital or acquired, the I feel like the less I I, I understand about it. And that's that's the absolute truth. But um, you know, we're a surgery, uh, we're a we're a specialty that really prides itself on on precision. And, um, you know, over the course of um, you know, decades, going back to, to Cushing, there have been innovations within neurosurgery that have increased that precision, whether it's been the introduction of the, you know, micro neurosurgical technique and the operating microscope with Roten or, you know, brain lab navigation systems, you know, but I guess I would encourage, you know, our the next crop of, of you know, pediatric neurosurgeons, uh, some of which are, you know, on this Zoom chat right now, like Sharu Fury and uh, Andy Hale and a couple of these other guys to take that precision to nanoscale and molecular levels. Um, the fact is, is that a patient like this, which is a patient of mine that comes in through the emergency room, you know, we we look at this scan and, and we treat these patients almost the exact same way. And we use shunting, which is at least conceptually has not changed for decades. And, um, and uh, I, the, what, I, what I would like to try to convey in this talk is that taking this term hydrocephalus, which is more or less a garbage term at this point and breaking it apart into different subclusters that are defined by gene variants that hold uh, prognostic value and uh, potential diagnostic and therapeutic value is is a goal not only for hydrocephalus but a bunch of different uh, congenital diseases. Pediatric neurosurgery is a great field to be in if you're interested in in genetics. So here's some disclosures and and funding sources. I don't I don't have any disclosures. This is a, a famous wiring diagram from a, a medical textbook in the 70s by Guyton. It was given to me by my PhD advisor, and uh, it, it, what it illustrates is in an absurd way, the complex regulatory networks that are in place for any important homeostatic variable. And so um, if you take a, a, you know, any, any continuous variable like blood glucose or systolic blood pressure, if this is an important physiologic parameter, the body over time has developed redundant overlapping mechanisms to protect that variable. And uh, the question is, is if you're looking at something like cerebral spinal fluid homeostasis, what are the critical pathways, genes, so forth, that regulate that variable? And, and you'll, you'll see right off the bat that it's, um, you know, it, taking a hypothesis-driven approach um, can have utility, but, um, you know, you're biasing yourself to, you know, one particular quadrant of uh, and, and a very small part of it, perhaps, um, right out of the box, and uh, kind of closing your eyes to other biology that may not only be more interesting but more relevant. 
And so the beauty of a, a genetic approach is you you take off those uh, blinders, but in an unbiased way, and you say, I, I don't know what's going on, and I'm going to let the, the biology and the, the genomics tell me what's going on, and then pr pursue that angle, whether it's your expertise or not. And, and in fact, uh, a fun part of the lab is is we kind of get ourselves into situations where we might find a gene uh, for which we have uh, very little expertise in, uh, and then you find uh, a way to study it. And it's usually by teaming up with people who, who know more about it than you do. But in doing that, you make a lot of friends, you learn a lot of new things, and then you discover real biology. So a classic uh, way of getting a foothold on understanding disease pathophysiology is using Mendelian phenotypes. So from uh, a career standpoint, this definitely plays to uh, my strength on two accounts. Uh, first of all, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. And second of all, um, I was trained in, a, uh, in, in labs in which this approach uh, was fundamental. As I said, it's an unbiased and agnostic approach where you let the biology do the talking. It defines key components of complex pathways down to DNA base pair resolution. So if we're talking about increasing precision about the way that we think about uh, disease, this is uh, one way we could do it. Um, as my old PI used to say, the humans are the best model system because the findings are automatically relevant. So using human material uh, for, your, uh, uh, for, for your lines of investigation uh, kind of biases you towards relevance. And it's a tried and true uh, uh, mechanism. This isn't... Um, uh, we're just applying it to a different uh, problem. And so, you know, using old, uh, in, in the case of you know, HMG coi reductase, uh, that was used, uh, you know, Brown and Goldstein used positional cloning um, in the 80s to figure this out. And, and more recently, I'm just taking a couple of cardiovascular uh, uh, examples here from my wife. Um, so, and P PCSK9 is, uh, you know, more recently discovered using whole, ex whole exome sequencing, which I'll get into very, very rapidly. But, um, you know, that, 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 that's an enzyme that was, you know, originally ported, uh, uh, reported in, I think, one or two families in a JCI paper. And now I, I don't even know how much money they're making off that uh, drug. But, um, uh, it, you know, the, the genetic approach can unravel important disease biology that's relevant for more common forms of disease. So unmet needs for hydrocephalus patients, uh, Jen uh, touched on this before, but we really need a better diagnostic uh, uh, and classification scheme that has value for prognostication and treatment stratification. We talked about potential, you know, utility or lack thereof for ETV, CPC, and post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, um, but, you know, what about different treatment modalities and other forms of hydrocephalus? And then what I'm very interested in is the concept of doing good or doing better by patients by not doing anything to them. And I think that's particularly relevant uh, for uh, some forms of congenital hydrocephalus. So as, as physicians, um, you know, graduating from uh, you know, medical school, we take an oath uh, to first do no harm. And, um, you know, when I look back at, at some of the patients that, that I've treated that our field treats uh, for hydrocephalus with shunting, um, you know, I, I, I think that's an open question as to whether or not in, in some select folks by, by shunting them, we've improved outcomes or, or actually just increased risk of morbidity uh, and even mortality. So addressing these needs uh, would yield obvious uh, benefits, such as uh, decreasing patient morbidity and mortality, um, improving neurodevelopmental health, or, or what I like to call optimizing neurodevelopment. Um, you may be in a situation, especially with a congenital hydro kid, uh, with a mutation in a in a uh, you know in a gene that's critical for development, where you're not going to um, achieve the expectation that that mom wants. Um, but by knowing, uh, you know, the underlying condition, you might be able to optimize uh, the situation or get them into early, you know, intervention programs and so forth. Um, I think this has wide relevance, especially for the stuff that, that Jen is doing uh, for, uh, you know, 
children around the world where they don't have access to, uh, you know, neurosurgeons and all the fancy equipment that we do in, in the States or in uh, resource rich countries. So, you know, finding ways to treat this disease better is, um, by now it's a bit cliche, but it, it's so true. We can, we can do a lot better. There's, there's some challenges for, um, gene discovery in the congenital heterocephalus uh, space. And I included a couple of them here, including locus heterogeneity, the phenotypic complexity, the, the disease. And I would, I would actually suggest that, you know, if you're thinking about whether neurosurgeons can make contributions to, um, you know, genomic studies or, or basic science in general, I would say that putting together these cohorts uh, is is one of them. Um, you know, I've, I've seen other groups kind of tackle um, tackle this without having a, a decent understanding of, you know, primary versus secondary forms of hydro, even even the different forms of acquired hydro. And, and it, it's clear that having that clinical insight um, can yield uh, great fruit. Um, the sporadic nature of most uh, congenital hydrocephalus cases is is an obvious roadblock to using classical, uh, you know, familial, uh, you know, gene segregation approaches or you know, positional cloning back in the day. But uh, whole exome sequencing and, and more recently whole genome sequencing, so-called next generation sequencing technologies, allows uh, the identification of genes in precisely these situations. As I said before, it's unbiased, it's systematic. Um, and, and even in, you know, for some uh, phenotypes, um, you can uh, find a gene uh, and, and do so in a relatively small cohort. We recently um, uh, found a, a new Moya Moya risk gene. Uh, I mean, I think we got, we got lucky and then we were able to find a, a validation a cohort for it. But uh, Peter Jin, who I, who I think is on the uh, uh, present, you know, he's in the chat room for this today. He's down at WashU. Uh, we were able to find a moya moya gene and i think only 25 trios or something like that and and so you know you can move pretty fast on this and and that's what that we've done that for a couple of phenotypes now um, the importance of gene discovery outside of gaining um you know understanding of what what the pathophysiology of the disease is is it also provide, provides insight into normal brain development and that's a, a fundamental thing i wanted to bring up today is the fact that we can you know thinking about hydrocephalus um, at least congenital hydrocephalus, not only about fluid, but also about the, you know, the, the, the T2 dark component on that big uh, MRI uh, uh, scan that um, it can provide insights into um, uh, human corticogenesis and the genetic regulation, you know, thereof. Um, finding genes uh, for congenital hydrocephalus might allow us to develop uh, a classification scheme where different subtypes are linked to different outcomes or prognoses, different treatment uh, responses. And then um, lastly, it can encourage the development of precision medicine, th medicine therapies, which uh, you know, with the techniques with CRISPR base editing and, and some other things that are uh, available now that people are applying to Mendelian disorders like spinal muscular atrophy and some other conditions. This is not this is not a crazy um, venture to think uh, could could be applied to this disease for congenital hydro. So we set up this uh, HydroSeq platform a few years ago now, whose goal was to uh, you know take a functional genomics approach to discover, validate, and then gain mechanistic insight into newly identified genes and mutations. It had three goals, still does, it's, uh, it's ongoing. We've taken uh, two swings and we've, um, uh, we're in the middle of taking the third swing right now, which we call Hydro V3, which will be out, um, I don't know, sometime next year probably. Um, but our, our goals were threefold. One was to, uh, first of all, expand uh, what we already had and then uh, characterize the largest congenital hydrocephalus cohort in the world. Um, it wasn't difficult at that time because there really weren't any cohorts to my knowledge or, or very big ones. But we've um, kind of doubled down on this uh, condition along with other a couple other conditions in the lab and have taken a multi-pronged uh, recruitment approach. This is uh, uh, an approach uh, that takes both family-centered social media engagement and then physician-directed referrals and now um, powerfully with industry collaborations with some different 
um, partners who are sequencing a whole bunch of different patients for a bunch of different reasons. So those those three things together can can increase your ends and therefore the uh, power for gene discovery kind of in an exponential way. And then uh, through um, you know, a recent interest in the lab is using uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing algorithms, and again, made possible with these industry co collaborations where we're, we're able to take patients' medical records, scan them, read the language, and make associations for particular patients um, with discovering endophenotypes that are linked with certain d uh, gene variants that you would never be able to come up with otherwise. So usually we took, you know, before this, we were taking a more classical uh, phenotyping uh, regimen, uh, uh, which is laborious um, and, uh, you know, usually takes, a, uh, uh, you know, someone with pretty decent uh, medical knowledge to, to surf through, but now we can, you know, teach a machine uh, to do it. Uh, the, aim, the second aim is really to do the genetics, uh, find um, uh, damaging de novo mutations and, and inherited uh, uh, gene mutations that are associated with congenital hydrocephalus, and we use uh, statistics to justify uh, our findings. And then after we come up with high confidence genes that have you know certain definitions that we could get into, uh, we validate them. Um, uh, if needed uh, in, in a model organism, there's medium throughput and then you know, classic model organisms like uh, uh, mice and we create both. The purpose of uh, the model creation is to um, use them to dig a little bit deeper into both uh, the, the physiology, the, the molecular and the, the cellular mechanisms and uh, uh, hopefully set up some, some drug screens uh, and base editing approaches for um, for treatment. So this is uh, our current cohort um, is about 1300 uh, trios and it kind of is growing uh, daily. Uh, this includes uh, from sources that I uh, mentioned uh, previously. This is uh, probably one of Shruta's uh, slides. Uh, she's a, a resident uh, at the Barrow now and, and really was um, the kind of the brains and the uh, originator of this uh, of this project in the lab, and um, you know along with Andrew Timberlake, who was a, a PhD student in uh, my old lab at that time, um, they kind of came up with this social media uh, recruitment platform that has really been the cornerstone uh, of of our patient, um, you know, getting the numbers that we do. Um, this is the uh, the phenomics program that Adam Kondeshora, a current uh, uh, chief uh, neurosurgery resident at Yale uh, and fantastic surgeon, is actually uh, uh, developing. Uh, this I think this data is actually from arachnoid cyst, but I put it in here for uh, hydro just because the phenomics is more advanced for that phenotype. But we're we're literally applying this in real time to the hydro cohort now. But but these are. Um, these are subclusters of congenital hydrocephalus that um, are defined by both uh, endophenotypes. So, you know, craniofacial disorder, epilepsy, you know, things that are associated uh, neurodevelopmental phenotypes uh, in these congenital hydrocephalus patients. And then overlaid on top of that are the specific gene variants that that are causative. And, and you can see that there's there's. Um, some nice overlap in those conditions. Some of the people that I've been referring to, I just wanted to give um, a credit to uh, uh, Peter below and and uh, Shruta uh, up there in the upper right hand corner. Jason, not a part of the genetics platform, but he um, uh, studies uh, hydrocephalus from the the you know acquired hydrocephalus and in work. Um, similar a bit to what, what Jen does in, in the sense of using um, post-hemorrhagic models to gain uh, disease mechanisms. But I just wanted to give this credit because I, I, I these are the guys that have really done the work. Jason uh, just got done with his uh, MGH uh, sub-I um, a couple weeks ago, and he's going to be applying this year for anybody looking for an outstanding uh, neurosurgery resident for uh, for 2022. So here's uh, some genes. This I think is from the Hydro V2 analysis. The red ones um, achieve exome wide significance. Um, and I just wanted to call attention to this top gene because I'm going to 
show a few slides very briefly of some mechanistic data uh, that we've uh, been able to dig into a little bit in mouse um, uh, trim 71. Um, we take the next step and uh, in, along uh, with Engen uh, at, at Yale, um, who's an ICU doc, but, a, but an outstanding uh, scientist as well. We've developed this, um, I'd call it a medium throughput um, platform where we're able to uh, use CRISPR uh, or Morpholino, knock down your gene of interest, express the wild type uh, human uh, gene uh, uh, ortholog, or uh, the same gene with the engineered uh, point mutation or, or whatever kind of mutation you're interested in to um, to prove uh, gene causality and then begin to explore things like uh, you know impact on cilia, uh, you know ventricle size and, and so forth. So we've got this kind of a cool program where we're able to kind of uh, create literal you know av frog avatars of your own patients if uh, if that doesn't sound too weird, but it's true uh, in the sense that you can take a patient of yours who has hydro, uh, sequence them, find a, a, a disease-causing mutation. I think the one in the upper right-hand corner is in uh, CRB2, um, which caused aqueductal stenosis. We can recapitulate aqueductal stenosis in frogs um, and have the exact uh, patient-engineered uh, mutation um, that is rescued with the wild type, but not with the disease-causing mutation. Um, we've been able to use this model to define some uh, flow fields in cilia, but I'm not going to get into that now. Here are some um, mutations identified in TRIM71, and you can see right out of the box that um, they localize um, to two different uh, residues, which is extremely uncommon. Uh, and and um, uh, but when it when it does uh, occur, you can uh, be proof positive that they're from a genetic standpoint they are uh, causative. They localize to these NHL binding domains, which bind. Uh, uh, mRNA targets and TRIM71 is a uh, mRNA uh, an RNA regulator. This is a work of um, uh, uh, Zui Fan. He's on the upper left hand corner. He'll be applying in two years to neurosurgery residency. So I wanted to pump hum, pump uh, him up a little bit. Um, but this paper um, is uh, in revision at Nature Neuroscience. So he'll have a, a big one. Um, he basically found that uh, TRIM71 is a neuroepithelial cell uh, marker, and uh, neuroepithelial cells, of course, are uh, 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 the earliest neur neural stem cell uh, population in the prenatal brain that lines the neural tube and then uh, ultimately the, uh, uh, the, the brain, brain ventricle. So he's uh, created a mouse that has a point mutation from a, a, a you know, humanized point mutation. Um, that is able to recapitulate the hydrocephalus phenotype. He's shown that uh, in two different uh, uh, Cree drivers of uh, neural stem cell specific genes that um, neural stem cell uh, deletion of TRIM71 in neural stem cell specifically is sufficient to cause hydrocephalus uh, prenatally. Um, he shows that uh, impaired uh, TRIM71 function leads to decreased neural stem cell proliferation and actually precocious differentiation, which uh, depletes the available neural uh, stem cell pool in the germinal matrix for subsequent uh, corticogenesis. And at a molecular level, these um, recurrent uh, mutations uh, at both uh, arginine 608 and 796 in humans have the appear to have the same effect in which they um, lose uh, their capability to uh, bind and therefore degrade critical targets. And he's gone on to take a computational approach um, uh, using ChIP-seq uh, to identify the uh, the the important targets. I think this is really important, and it 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 speaks of uh, his work um, because what he's found is that uh, because of the decreased uh, cort essentially de decreased cortical mass from decreased neurogenesis, these brains are very highly compliant. So for any um, given amount of uh, fluid at a specific pressure. Um, that uh, the, the ventricle uh, becomes bigger. And, and the, 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 essentially, while the cilia function uh, normally, the ependema is normal, there's no 
aqueductal obstruction, yet because of the highly compliant cortical mantle, you just accommodate a large amount of fluid that has very inefficient um, uh, you know, fluid dynamics. Uh, essentially, it's, it's like a, an eddy in a river where the, the laminar flow is just uh, severely compromised. So, which makes sense. And, and as a neurosurgeon, uh, pediatric neurosurgeon, and any pediatric neurosurgeon knows this, we take a patient sometimes like this to the operating room and you measure their ICP, it can be 10, right? So is that hydrocephalus? I don't know. But yet they may or may not be dependent, uh, you know, CSF diversion dependent, meaning for their clinical status uh, to, you know, be maintained, uh, even to survive, they may need a shunt or not. Uh, and so that's the uh, the conundrum that we're finding. So uh, here's a, a very uh, you know simplified uh, model of of at least this specific type of hydrocephalus defined by Trim seventy one mutation. But we like to think of this as a prototype of several other um, uh, genes that that we found of some of them that operate uh, in you know in similar pathways. And so this is a a, 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 a paradigm. Uh, that we're building that we feel has you know treatment uh, implications, even if it means um, that that treatment is being you know withheld from a certain you know individual who may have high uh, you know who may have huge uh, brain ventricles whose neurodevelopment is compromised, and you may or may not be getting pushed by neurology or or you know the the family you know for CSF diversion potential. Uh, and, 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 and surgery, um, but the better part of valor in, in some of those circumstances, you know, may be uh, to actually withhold uh, treatment. So we've shown that uh, in, a, in some subsequent work that exome sequencing can be a potential uh, and, a, you know, an important diagnostic adjunct in evaluating these patients uh, when they come through uh, your door, whether it's through the office or down, uh, down through the emergency room. So um, I'd like to thank, you know, all the lab members. I, I tried to intercalate them uh, instead of just having the acknowledgement slide at the end, but um, uh, especially uh, these guys and, uh, and Zui, Tyrone, another uh, uh, Dispenza, another uh, MD-PhD student in lab um, will be, I think, applying next year. So it's a passion of mine to not only work on these problems, but to, you know, ment help mentor and, and, and interact and foster the careers of, uh, you know, the, the, the next generation of, of folks as pediatric uh, neurosurgeons or neurosurgeon scientists, you know, the best that I can. So thanks for your time. That was incredible. Thank you both um, for really two spectacular talks. Um, so I'm going to go right into the um, question answer session. Um, so uh, the first question is, as for CSF, is there any different in the composition between normal um, and hydrocephalus, such as the ions, osmotic pressure, protein, cell contents, white blood cell composition? Um, I think it depends on the specific uh, reason why you have hydrocephalus. Um, I know uh, my partner, uh, Dave Lumberg, is working on a study sort of looking at this currently. Um, so I think the short answer is it depends. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting in you know, being at uh, MGH and one of the one of the, another one of the reasons why I came up here was the ability to um, study and treat patients kind of across the disease spectrum, including transitional age patients and uh, and adults. And so you kind of get into these waters. Um, I, I currently take care of a lot of the nor, uh, NPH folks too here. It's it's fascinating how 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 different um, the, the the parameters just mentioned uh, are, and I'm sure that's going to be the upshot of uh, of David's work. Um, and and it just you know really uh, the the term normal pressure hydrocephalus. I, it, the, I think the terms are, are probably causing a lot more problems than they are, uh, are helping people. So I think, you know, coming, you know, coming up with some new names or that, that have, you know, pathophysiologic meaning, um, I think would be, you know, a major goal of, this, of, of all this work that Jen and I are, and, and others are trying to do. 
I think that's um, you know one of the one of the conversations that um, I think we've all had in pediatric neurosurgery is this transitional component because all of our patients um, eventually become adults and who takes care of them and I think now in this revenue driven um, healthcare system unfortunately uh, where a lot of the adult neurosurgeons are really driven by revenue um, you know how are these now transitional patients getting the best care, um, because as we all know, you know, hydrocephalus yes. isn't a revenue generating machine. And so I think it's an important conversation um, that, you know, warrants uh, more, more conversation for us as pediatric neurosurgeons and, and who's gonna take care of our patients as they get older. Is it us? Is it our, our adult colleagues? Um, but I think it's an important- I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting topic, a bit off topic probably for, for this conversation, but maybe that's a, uh, we can add, add that to the list, Heather. I'd be really interested in participating with that because that, that's been a um, epiphany uh, to me over the, uh, over the course of the last, you know, especially, you know, being for Jen, you know, down at, down at Wash U or, you know, you're at Boston Children's or, you know, kids are knocking on your door uh, and you, you can't, you're too, you're so busy. I mean, you, you don't need to think about that other stuff, but in, in other situations where, you know, you're a pediatric neurosurgeon, but in a, um, you know, in a, in a, in an adult hospital, essentially, uh, even if it's a huge adult hospital, I think there's a ton of room the, the, for, you know, pediatric neurosurgeons, in my, in my opinion, should be taking care of transitional age patients. And in fact, just thinking about, you know, not just transitional age patients, but pac any patients with these disease phenotypes. And so because the fact is, is that, you know, uh, it gets harder uh, to take care of these patients as they get older because they're, they're reoperations, they're there, there's a whole bunch of you know, psychiatric, social problems. You can make a real um, difference. Um, and, and these patients, you know, after they're 18 or so, they really get hung out to dry. Um, and, and a lot of people don't like to, um, you know, pick them up. But you can make a really huge difference by, by kind of opening yourself up to, to those, that, that age. Um, so... We touched on sort of in between the two talks, uh, reservoirs and timing of intervention along the same bent um, based on sort of understanding either the genetics or the composition in post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Any thoughts on reservoir versus VSGS and, and uh, timing of each of those compared to the definitive treatment that you guys have based on your research? Um. My biases clinically. Yeah, my understanding is that reservoirs are at least have shown to be a, a be equivalent to a subgaleal shunts. And then, you know, I think the Elvis trial is a, is a great, probably the best data that we have, which, you know, if we are going to extrapolate from that, would say that we need to be intervening probably earlier than we do in the U.S. in general. Um, I think endoscopic lavage is another earlier treatment that I think we're starting to do as well. Um, yeah, so similar to before, um, I think the best data probably comes from the Elvis trial. Um, but I don't, I don't know what you think, Chris, about timing for temporary intervention for PHH. I don't know. I, I, I feel like, I feel like my own mode changes every few months, depending on my, the last experience or bad experience that I've, I've had. It just, there's the, the options are really not very great. And, um, yeah. and so, you know, I, I like, I've, I've not done any of the, um, uh, the ventricular lavage stuff. I think that that makes a lot of sense clearing out mm -hmm. those products, um, in, intuitively. Um, um, I'm, I'm pretty interested in, you know, there was a, a trial where that looked at furosemide, um, in this, in this, in the setting for uh, neonatal post hemorrhagic, it was, a, it's an old one, uh, negative mm -hmm. data published in, I think Lancet or something like that. And, um, you know, furosemide and bumetanide for that matter, when given systemically, really don't really get into this, uh, the, the central nervous system uh, all that well. And so I think there was a, there was a flaw in the study there. I don't, I don't think, um, targeting ion transport, by the way, is the answer uh, for that. But I think that 
um, you know, some of what gen stuff, uh, what, you know, the, the pathways that she's targeting, I think inflammation probably as more of an upstream, a component, mm -hmm. um, I think we're beginning to realize, you know, more and more. And, and I think that that probably holds a lot of weight. Um, anyway, you, you can see how rapidly I shifted from what we're currently, what we currently have to what we, what, what I would like to see just because I, you know, you can pick your reservoir or it, it just, it's, it's all pretty suboptimal. Along the same bent of, of future versus now, um, are any of the, um, genetic pathways you're pulling out and the congenital hydro things that are druggable or you see us treating more through a medical pathway as opposed to a surgical pathway in the future? Yeah, I, I see base editing as being a, a as being a real, of being a potential mode. I, I think it's going to be challenging for drug therapy for congenital hydrocephalus. Although Tyrone, uh, not to get out in front of his stuff too much, but um, I tweeted out his uh, his review paper a couple of days ago on uh, P10. Um, you know that's his gene, that's his favorite gene, and uh, and and actually very commonly mutated in uh, sporadic congenital hydro from a de novo mutation standpoint. And you know some of these patients uh, have over you know neural stem cell overgrowth around the level of the aqueduct. And that can cause obstruction and, uh, you know, PFAS crowding uh, in some circumstances. And so thinking about, you know, pathways that, that target that, um, it, you know, it, it'd be difficult to think of how to, how to administer that or the, you know, the timing. But, um, you know, that, that, is, that is one targetable pathway. Um, but, I, but I think genetic, genetic base editing, editing is, is the more feasible, uh, you know, option going forward. Shelly or Toba, do you have any other questions to throw out? I think we have, we're done with audience questions unless uh, someone else uh, has any others. Um, Dr. Wang, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, that was very, those were very two extremely good um, presentations. It was really nice to hear some of your research, um, some of the work that you've done, very cutting edge, really great stuff that you guys are doing. Um, I do have one quick question for Jen. Um, what are your criteria currently for um, ventricular lavage? Like what kind of population are you offering that to? Um, and are you only um, offering that to the post hemorrhagic children or are you also um, offering it to the post meningitic um, lower infectious uh, hydrocephalus as well? So we currently, we have everything set up to do it. I got this in, in place right before COVID started with the Artemis and uh, all the, you know, appropriate setup and, um, you know, buy-in from the NICU as well. And then we had like no IVH patients for a year and a half <laughs> that oh. were, you know, that, that were good candidates. So, um, we're still in the infancy of the actual lavage phase. Um, we do, I do a lot of endoscopy, um, Sandy lamb from Lurie. I don't know if she's on the call. She's had, you know, some experience with it as well. I think based on the literature and from what I've heard from talking to others that have had some experience with it is, um, we need to have the right patient where they're not too small. Um, and I think, uh, waiting too long is not a great option either. So I think the ideal patient that we've been waiting for is someone that has a large component of intraventricular blood that is, is not, you know, 600 grams. That maybe is more of like an 800, maybe eight, 900 grams, someone that's a little bit older at maybe 25 to 27 weeks gestation. Um, there were a, a few babies that were very small, you know, like 23 weekers that I felt like, and, and, the, and their, their component of the, the, you know, periventricular hemorrhagic infarction was larger than the amount of intraventricular blood. So um, more to come, I'll let you know. <laughs> and then are you offering it to like the older children who, for example, have like, ventriculitis or um, infectious? Um, um, I haven't had any specific cases come up in the last year or year and a half um, since we have everything set up for it. 
Um, yeah, so I haven't done any lavage in those cases. Questions? Um, so Ed, I'd just like to take a minute, thank that both of the speakers, again, really uh, thought provoking uh, discussion. You know, I think I, I completely agree uh, with Chris's comment that the more hydrocephalus we treat, the more we realize that we don't fully understand hydrocephalus. Um, and so I think it's really nice to go back to some uh, basic science and uh, hopefully, you know, in five, 10 years, we'll have better treatments for all of these children, regardless of the etiology of their hydrocephalus. So uh, thanks to everyone for joining in today. Um, our next session in November is going to be on pediatric head trauma. Um, Tina Duhame is going to be speaking and then uh, we have another speaker uh, to be announced. Uh, so uh, we look forward to that as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, guys. Thank Very you so good much. Talk. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Have a good evening.